Hi, who is this attractive guy? Cindy's question stunned both husband Jim and her friend Barbara even before they crossed the backyard. Barbara followed Cindy's gaze and noticed Adam's friend, Cindy's brother-in-law. Understanding the situation, Jim reminded his wife that he was nearby. What? I can't admire a handsome guy when I see him. She objected. Well, if you're going to look after some guy, I'd rather you keep it to yourself. Jim replied a little sharply, before turning his attention back to the owners of the house. Barbara and her husband Tony were having a birthday party outside for their daughter, who had just turned 13. Barbara saw them coming, but she hadn't greeted them yet. She decided to ignore Cindy's question. Don't worry, you two. Come in, she said, holding onto the gate. Where is it needed? Jim asked, holding a case of beer. The tree has some ice coolers, Jim. Some have soft drinks for children, while others have beer. Just choose an empty one. Put the gifts on that table over there, she pointed out to Cindy, who was carrying the beautifully wrapped gift. Tony, the co-host, noticed them and came over to greet them. Hi, you two. Welcome, he said, kissing Cindy on the cheek. Jimbo, give it to me. As Cindy reached for the drawer, she hinted again. Hey, Tony, who's that handsome guy sitting there with your brother? Tony. A little slow and unaware of the previous conversation, looked where Cindy pointed. He's called Bob, something. He works with Adam at a construction site. Why, a sign or something? No, but I wouldn't mind, she replied. I mean, what a handsome guy. Tony looked at Jim with embarrassment. Not fully understanding the situation, he tried to defuse the situation. Watch out, Jim. I think she's hunting. He joked. Jim was just as confused. It seemed like his wife was trying to make him jealous for some reason, but he didn't want to ruin the evening, so he pretended that everything was fine and smiled. Yes, it seems she's ready to swap me for a younger guy. I'll get down to business, Barbara said, slapping Jim on the arm. Well, come on in, guys, Tony said. Barbara, show Cindy where to leave the presents. When Barbara saw the expression on her husband's face, she immediately realized that he suspected something unusual. He hoped she would be interested in Cindy's behavior. On the way to the gift table, she lowered her voice so that no one could overhear. Okay, Sin, what's going on here? Did you and Jim have a fight or something? What is it? She asked. What do you mean? Don't tell me that. We've all been friends for a long time and I've never heard you say that in front of Jim. Something is wrong. I'm just giving him a piece of his own pie. He's been hanging around all the beautiful girls all day. Do you know Linda Kingston? Yes. She saw Jim at the restaurant a few days ago. Obviously, he hadn't noticed her. She told me that the waitress came over and kissed him. They talked and laughed during lunch, flirting all the time. Cindy, Jim is a friendly and open guy. Barbara replied, that's his character. If a girl kisses you, it's more than just friendship, Barb. This is crossing the line, and you know it. Tony just kissed you on the cheek, Barbara countered. It's different. We have been friends for many years, but he's flirting with the waitress. I don't like it. And it clearly does not pass the wife's test. Wife's test. Yeah, you know, guys use it all the time. Only for them it's a husband test. A wife should not do anything in public or in private that she would not do in front of her husband. What Chenyat is allowed, Menka is not allowed. They say in similar situations. So did you choose my daughter's birthday to stress Jim out? Don't worry, I won't do anything drastic. I didn't even think about it until I saw Adam's friend there. It fits perfectly. I just want to give Jim a lesson. Well, please don't start any fights, okay? Don't worry, I promise. She looked around and noticed that Jennifer, the guest of honor, was hanging out with her friends. She decided to come over and wish her a happy birthday. Jim was just helping Tony with a beer and came to the same conclusion. They both came up at the same time. Cindy spoke first. Congratulations, baby, you're officially a teenager. 
Now you can be a real challenge for your parents, she joked. This is from me too, Jen, congratulations. I'm not sure about this story of difficulties for your parents, Jim joked. Jennifer laughed at Jim's joke. It was known in their circle that she had been in love with him since she was a little girl. Thank you, she replied, hugging Cindy and kissing Jim on the cheek. These are my friends, Coral, Katie, and Debbie, she introduced. They chatted a bit with Jen and her friends, but Cindy was impatient to continue her plan to teach Jim a lesson. Hello, dear, she said to the birthday girl. I'm going to say hello to your uncle. See you later. Jim was about to go with her when he noticed Tony giving him the signal. When Cindy started to leave, he noticed, behave yourself. She gave him an evil look. Approaching Tony, who was still at the drinks table, Jim asked, what's wrong, buddy? Tony replied, Bard talked to Cindy. I think you're flirting with one of the waitresses. Cindy heard that and decided to teach you a lesson. I think that's all the talk about. Jim thought for a moment and said, I have no idea what she's talking about. I didn't flirt with the waitress, as far as I know. Did she say where and who she said saw me? Tony replied, I'm not sure. She didn't elaborate, but it seems like she's planning to use Bob to make you jealous. So try to stay calm, okay? At this time, while Jim and Tony were talking, Cindy approached her victim. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cindy, how are you? He asked. It's okay, I guess. Who's your handsome guy? Adam was stunned until his friend stood up and introduced himself. Hi, I'm Bob. I guess you were talking about me, right? He said with a smile. Of course, Cindy replied. Hi, Cindy. Adam chimed in. Where's Jim? He's talking to your brother there. I'd like one too, she said pointing to the beer Bob was holding. Hey Adam, can you be a gentleman and bring the lady a beer while we get to know each other better? Not wanting to be rude, Adam agreed. As soon as he headed for the drinks table, Bob offered Cindy his vacant seat. She sat up and looked at her husband, who was glaring at her. His reaction only strengthened her confidence that her plan was working. She turned to start a conversation with a new acquaintance. At this time, when Adam approached the drinks table, he approached Tony and Jim. What's wrong with Cindy? He asked. Why? What happened? Jim exclaimed. She snuggled up to Bob there. Who is he anyway? Jim asked. He works with me. We are working on that big skyscraper in the city center. I've known him for about six months. Everything seems to be fine, but he's a bit of a lover of women and I wouldn't trust him around women. He didn't bring his girlfriend, Jim asked. No, it all happened at the last minute. His golf game was canceled today. Yesterday we finished work around five and he got a cancellation message. He started complaining that there was nothing to do today. So I invited him to a party. At least now Jim understood what his wife was up to, although he wasn't sure how to handle it. He knew Cindy well, when she was up to something, she didn't back down until she got her point across. Ignoring her could only make her angrier, and confronting her could trigger protests from Bob. He intended to avoid such a situation at all costs. Adam, do me a favor, okay? Just make sure that things don't get out of hand. Tell me if something starts happening. Adam confirmed Jim's instructions and took a cold beer from the fridge before returning to Bob and Cindy, they continued the conversation. While serving Cindy her beer and pulling another chair, Adam felt it was time to step in, hoping it would give Bob a hint. He mentioned that he had seen photos of Jim from the fire at the sawmill and praised his talent, wondering if Jim was going to participate in the press photographer competition this year. Although Cindy is a little annoyed by the interruption, she politely replied that she believed Jim was involved. She then informed Bob that her husband works as a photographer for the Tribute newspaper and won the state press photographer's competition several times last year. Bob replied with a note of disdain, confirming Jim's presence across the room. Bob and Adam noticed this response, and he encouraged Cindy to continue the conversation with Bob and actually excluded Adam from the discussion. He felt stupid. 
He had heard Bob use that phrase before about working well with his hands on women in bars. It always impressed them, and here Adam unknowingly gave Bob the opportunity. Realizing that he was doing more harm than good, Adam apologized and went to wish his niece a happy birthday once again. Jim moved around, communicating with others, carefully watching Cindy and her companion. Although none of the men mentioned his wife's collaboration with another man, the women started gossiping. Jim overheard Jenny discussing the situation with her friends, mentioning that the man Cindy was talking to worked as a photographer for a newspaper. She added that her father noted that photographers often find themselves in various difficult situations because of their work. Jenny expressed surprise that Jim did not physically intervene. Jim shook his head. After all, no one was particularly to blame except his wife, and although he sometimes felt annoyed, he would never resort to violence against her or any other woman. Glancing to the side, he noticed an empty beer bottle next to Cindy's chair, and the second one was already in her hand. She usually drinks more when she's nervous. This is not good. Bob had three empty bottles next to his chair. At that moment, Tony noticed that everyone was starting to get hungry. He was standing at the grill. Jim, who was busy with Cindy, did not even notice the attractive aroma of fried meat. Tony then announced the food options available, including burgers, bratwurst, and minced chicken cutlets, as well as various side dishes on a nearby table for everyone to serve themselves. Jim thought this might be a good opportunity to separate Bob from his wife. Maybe they can find a nook to eat, and he can find out more about this man he's supposedly flirting with. Turning to them, he saw that the potential lovers were putting their beer bottles next to the chairs and getting up. Obviously, Bob decided that Cindy would be with him today and pretentiously grabbed her by the elbow. It's not going to work, Jim muttered. He came over quickly. Excuse me, could you take your hand off my wife? Bob immediately released Cindy's hand and raised both hands in a gesture of reconciliation. Sorry, he laughed a little. We were just going to go eat. Come on, I'll manage on my own, thanks, Jim replied angrily. He grabbed Cindy by the other elbow and led her to the food table. What happened to you? Cindy asked. It was incredibly rude. Ignoring his wife's comment, Jim led her forward so they could get in line for food. Grab the food, he said dryly. You and I will talk at the barn while we eat. Watching the confrontation between Jim and Bob, Adam took the opportunity to talk to a colleague. Now they were alone for the first time in a long time. What are you doing? He asked, annoyed. She is married to one of my brother's closest friends. Leave her alone. Hey man, you should tell her to leave me alone. She's flirting with me, and I'm just being polite. Polite, my leg. Seriously, Bob, that's enough. Look, if you think you have a chance with her, forget it. She's using you to get back at Jim for some waitress. Stay away from it. Listen, Bob warned meekly. If she comes near me again, I'll send her straight back to her husband, okay? If you don't, you're out of here, Bob. I'm serious. I promise, he replied, raising his hand in a scout salute. Can I go eat? Yes, of course, go. Of course, Cindy wasn't particularly worried about Jim coming between her and Bob. They had only met a few hours ago, but he had already become too close, not to mention the hints he was making. Although it was funny to see how easily she could manipulate such a man when she wanted to. However, she felt that with Jim she had already pushed her husband further than she should have. She promised Barbara that there would be no drama, and Jim has already shown that he is not intimidated by Bob's appearance. She needed to spend the rest of the day with her husband. She just hoped he understood his lesson. They both put food on plates, and Jim pointed to the barn, away from the crowd. When they found a quiet place, he handed Cindy his plate. Take it. Hold it while I get a couple of chairs. I'll be right back. Hiding his annoyance, Jim remained a gentleman, holding the back of the chair as Cindy sat down. He put his chair next to hers so they could talk in private. After a few bites, Jim couldn't hold back anymore because he's always straightforward. He asked Cindy about the conversation about his flirtation with the waitress, expressing his dissatisfaction with such games. 
Cindy replied that she wasn't sure about the exact details, but it allegedly happened last week. Jim quipped about the uncertainty of the information. Cindy suggested that Jim might understand the situation better than she did and asked if he was flirting with all the waitresses. Surprised, Jim intervened, asking if he had been told that he was kissing them. Cindy confirmed this, and Jim confidently stated that there were only two possibilities. Either it's a mix-up, or someone's made a fuss, because he's only kissed Cindy since they started dating. Cindy stared deeply into his eyes, unsure of his honesty this time. He had never lied to her before, as far as she knew. But why would anyone claim to have seen her kissing a waitress if it wasn't true? I don't know, he shrugged, taking a bite of his burger. Since she's your friend, ask her. But how do you know it's a woman? It better be a woman. If a male friend told you he saw me kissing a waitress, then that's the answer. Cindy responded, feeling uncertain. Initially, she considered the possibility that he saw her friend at the restaurant and still kissed the waitress, disregarding any potential consequences. However, his last statement confused her. What do you mean? She asked. If it's a man, then I've already figured it out. Simple. If it is a man, he's into you and trying to cause trouble between us. He's probably hoping to get close to you by being the supportive friend, he explained. That's absurd, Cindy rebutted. Is it? Think about it. Was it a man? No. Exactly. So now we're back to square one. You'll need to ask your friend why she's misleading you, he replied. An uneasy silence followed as they finished their lunches. Jim had some final words before leaving. This is Jenny's birthday party, and I won't let it be ruined by a fight with your friend. So if you keep cozying up to him like you have been, I'll just leave you here. You can find your own way home or spend the night with Mr. Muscles, but then you won't have a home to come back to. Understand? Taken aback by his intensity, Cindy responded, Jim, calm down. I'm not going home with Bob. I wasn't even considering it. I was just trying to show you how it feels to have your spouse flirt with someone else. That's all. Well, now you've shown me. So let's end it here, Jim said, standing up and collecting their trash. He was relieved to see his wife right by his side. As he turned back, however, Bob was displeased. He had been watching their conversation while eating alone, growing more annoyed. He had no doubt that Cindy was interested, but the need for discretion made him postpone any plans for now as they were being washed. Despite their tensions, Jim and Cindy were determined to enjoy the rest of the party. Cindy stayed close to him, but occasionally wandered off to chat with friends, always returning to his side. The only other interaction she had with Bob was during the group singing of Happy Birthday, when everyone gathered around Jenny's cake. Bob took advantage of the moment, discreetly touching her backside while everyone was distracted. At first, she assumed it was Jim, but when she glanced over, she saw Bob's smug grin. She was stunned by his audacity, but knew reacting would only escalate the situation, and she realized she had encouraged him with her behavior. Given the chance, she intended to apologize to him and make it clear she wasn't interested. Bob withdrew his hand to join the applause as the birthday girl blew out the candles. Jim noticed Bob's voice nearby, but thought nothing of it. Naturally, Cindy wouldn't confess to him about Bob's inappropriate behavior during the birthday song. Bob, on the other hand, interpreted her silence as consent. He knew how to manipulate the situation. Cindy had to stay close to her husband to avoid suspicion, but eventually, she would need to slip away to use the restroom indoors. Bob planned to catch her alone and arrange a meeting. He kept a discreet watch. For those who were aware of the earlier incident, the perceived threat seemed to have passed. With the exception of Jim, everyone relaxed and let their guard down. But Jim, having encountered men like Bob before, who believed they were irresistible to women, decided to continue keeping an eye on him just to be cautious. The party escalated after dinner. Music played in the background while games were set up, including a dartboard and a beanbag toss. Some women gathered for a game of bingo. Jenny and her friends suggested a best-of-three beanbag game to her parents, 
Jim and Cindy. Tony warned them of Jenny's skill. Fortunately, the adults emerged victorious in the initial game, although subsequent triumphs belonged to the younger players. Following the match, Cindy planted a gentle kiss on Jim's cheek before excusing herself to use the restroom, assuring him of her prompt return. Jim contemplated challenging Adam to a game of darts as he replied to Cindy, who took a detour to engage in a brief conversation with friends en route to the house. Once inside, she was grateful to discover an unoccupied downstairs restroom, slipping inside unnoticed. Adam's mutterings about Bob's sudden departure caught Jim's attention mid-throw, prompting him to inquire about the cryptic comment. Adam clarified that Bob seemed to be exiting without bidding farewell or expressing gratitude for the invitation. Jim glanced back and caught sight of Bob making his way out through the gate indicating that Bob might be disgruntled by Cindy's recent lack of attention and possibly had plans with her. Adam concurred, noting Bob's talent for charming women and recounting instances when he observed Bob leaving bars accompanied by attractive company. Returning his focus to the dartboard, Jim steadied his aim when a thought struck him. How could someone discreetly enter the house without detection? They would leave through the gate, circle around to the front, and utilize that entry point. Handing the darts to Adam, Jim announced that he would be right back before heading towards the back door. Meanwhile, Cindy completed her errand and proceeded to touch up her makeup. Opening the bathroom door, she was taken aback to find Bob standing there, his sudden presence leaving her momentarily stunned. Before she could react, he forcibly grabbed her shoulders, pressing her against the doorframe and forcefully locking their lips together in a moment of utter surprise. Had Jim been slightly delayed, he would have witnessed his wife forcefully pushing Bob away. Unfortunately, in that harrowing instant, Cindy hesitated, trying to make sense of the bewildering situation. It was then that Jim caught sight of them, his intuition confirming the unthinkable. With quick and decisive action, Jim seized Bob's shoulder, forcibly pulling him away from Cindy. In one fluid motion, he delivered a forceful blow to Bob's solar plexus, sending him stumbling back into the washroom where he collapsed, gasping for breath. Cindy's mind struggled to process the rapid succession of events, feeling overwhelmed by the whirlwind of emotions. It all happened so unexpectedly, and within the blink of an eye. Searching frantically for her husband, she realized he had vanished without a trace. Panic gripped her as she feverishly scanned every direction, calling out for Jim, but he was nowhere in sight. Suddenly, the sound of a car engine starting reached her ears. Rushing towards the front door, Cindy watched helplessly as their car backed out and drove off, leaving her alone to confront the perilous situation at hand. The gravity of how it must have appeared, especially considering her prior interactions with Bob, weighed heavily upon her. Disregarding Bob, who still struggled to catch his breath, she hastily made her way out through the back door. The first person she encountered was Adam, still unaware of the unfolding drama and patiently awaiting Jim's return. Filled with terror and desperation, she pleaded with Adam to drive her home immediately. Confusion clouded Adam's face as he tried to comprehend the unanticipated turn of events. Cindy, what happened? Where's Jim? He inquired. He left. He caught Bob kissing me and, she began, her voice trembling with panic. Adam's eyes widened in disbelief, interrupting her sentence. What? Is he hurt? Cindy attempted to explain the situation. No, Bob is still inside the house. I'm not sure if he's hurt or not. Jim punched him really hard. A smirk formed on Adam's face as he processed the information. Jim punched Bob. He echoed unable to hide a glimmer of amusement. Yeah, yeah, please, Adam. I have to get home so I can explain what happened. He was so mad. I'm not sure what he's going to do. I'm afraid he's planning to leave me, Cindy confessed, her words laced with profound fear. Adam reassured her, I doubt that, Cindy. He's upset, but I don't think he's that upset. Cindy's eyes filled with desperation as she pleaded. You didn't see him just now, Adam. Cindy, I was the first one here. 
You didn't see him just now, he replied, emphasizing his previous statement. Realizing the pressing need for a quick departure, Cindy reluctantly nodded her agreement, knowing she had to reach Jim before it was too late. Unfortunately, the tight parking situation obstructed their escape. With only a foot of space between Adam's car and the garage door, he skillfully maneuvered, turning the wheel to the right until his front bumper gently nudged the door. He then moved in reverse, turning the wheel in the opposite direction causing his rear bumper to make slight contact with the car parked behind him. Repeating this delicate balancing act several times, Adam successfully managed to free his car from the constricted space, leaving a mere two inches of clearance between his vehicle and the one behind on his brother's meticulously maintained front lawn. Throughout the harrowing journey, Cindy remained silent, lost in her tumultuous thoughts. The image of her husband's wrathful countenance haunted her mind his fury unlike anything she had ever witnessed before. His physical reaction had been unprecedented. As her dragway came into view, apprehension tightened its grip around her heart. She dreaded facing the unknown that awaited her at home. Eventually, they turned into her driveway, with Adam parking behind Jim's car. Adam extended his offer to accompany her inside, but she hesitated momentarily before politely declining. She expressed gratitude for his concern, but insisted on handling the situation herself, feeling a strong sense of responsibility. As she stepped out of the car, she signaled to Adam that she was capable and climbed the porch stairs with a mix of anticipation and anxiety. Entering the house, she prepared herself for whatever awaited her. Jim was nowhere to be found, and she worried that he might be upstairs packing his belongings. Just as she began ascending the stairs to confront him, the sound of the coffee grinder echoed through the house. A glimmer of hope stirred within her, thinking that perhaps Jim was making coffee. However, her hopes were soon shattered when Jim silently observed her from the kitchen doorway, breaking the silence with a question about her supposed lover. Cindy quickly clarified to Jim that Bob was not her lover, recalling their last encounter where she found him struggling on the bathroom floor. Jim nodded in response but remained eerily silent, unsettling Cindy. She had expected some kind of reaction from him, be it anger or embarrassment. Since Jim showed no willingness to speak, Cindy took it upon herself to initiate the conversation. He caught me off guard, Jim, she confessed. I wasn't willingly engaging with him. As soon as I opened the door, he ambushed me, pushing me against it and kissing me. I didn't see you resisting him. You intervened before I had the chance. I was stunned. It took me a moment to comprehend what was happening, but you struck him before I could push him away. Cindy couldn't determine if Jim's calm demeanor indicated genuine tranquility or if it was merely the calm before a storm. Throughout their conversation, he remained occupied with his tasks. Part of her wished he would openly express his anger as his apparent indifference left her feeling anxious. She couldn't help but prompt him further, needing closure. Well, she urged. Well, what? Jim replied, pressing the start button on the coffee maker. Cindy couldn't help but voice her surprise. Jim, I've never seen you so angry before. I honestly expected you to be packing your bags when I got home. Don't tempt me, he growled, his voice rising slightly. You're damn right I'm angry. That stunt you pulled was immature and disrespectful. The only reason I'm not even more upset is because most people at the party were aware of what you were doing. But you know what infuriates me more than you making a spectacle of yourself. The fact that you chose to trust one of your shallow friends over me. Have I ever lied to you? Have I ever given you a reason to doubt me or be jealous? No, never. His suppressed anger began to surface, and Cindy remained silent, unsure of how to respond to his accusations. She had never heard him refer to her friends as shallow before, but she decided to let it slide. Attempting to calm the situation, she slowly spoke, Honey, I know how outgoing you are. I've witnessed it. You can strike up a friendship with anyone in minutes, even with women. You may not realize it, but I've seen the way they look at you when you walk away. I know they'd be willing to drop their inhibitions in an instant. 
Oh, that's ridiculous. You're making me sound like Brad Pitt or something. Jim retorted, the situation escalating. Realizing the need to defuse it before it worsened, Cindy tried to steer the conversation in a different direction. Jim, all I'm saying is that you have a charming personality. People are naturally drawn to you. I just want you to understand that some women interpret that as flirting. They might think you're available, married or not. Hoping she had lessened the tension, Cindy awaited Jim's response. Instead, he hit her with a question she had hoped to avoid. Their argument persisted for another 20 minutes without resolution, each refusing to yield on the fundamental issue of trust. Though they didn't resort to sleeping separately, Cindy sensed that closeness was currently out of the question. Jim remained unforgiving, and she refused to degrade herself by attempting to change his mind. The following Tuesday, Jim met his friend Tony for a drink after work. As Jim sat, taking a sip from his beer, Tony arrived with a wide grin. Attempting to lighten the mood, Tony quipped in his best Stalom impression, Yo, Rocky, how's Adrian? Jim glanced at his friend, amused. Isn't Rocky the one who talks like that? Tony chuckled and ordered a beer as he sat down beside Jim. Yap, yeah, but I can't pull off a Burgess Meredith impression, so you'll have to settle for what you get. Seriously, how are things between you two? Right now, you're barely on speaking terms. I'm still angry, and she knows it, so she tends to avoid me. Tony pressed, when are you going to cut her some slack? Most people at the party didn't even realize there was tension between you two. After you left, some folks were asking about you and Cindy. What did you tell them? I mentioned that something unexpected had come up, and you had to leave. Nobody questioned it. They probably assumed that you two were eager to get home. And well, you know, Tony chuckled. Yeah, well, we haven't exactly been eager to get in bed since the party. Speaking of which, what's the deal with Bob? Is he plotting revenge? I doubt it. Adam filled me in on what happened before he drove Cindy home. When I went inside, Bob was just getting back on his feet. He mentioned you landed a sucker punch. I sure did, Jim interjected. Well, he was talking about getting back at you, but I warned him to steer clear of you. I told him you're the toughest guy around, and that I've seen you take down guys twice your size. I even threw in my favorite Bible quote. You have a favorite Bible quote? I didn't know that. Sure do. Yeah. Though he walks through the valley of the shadow of pass away, he fears no evil, for he's the toughest and meanest sob in the valley. That's you. Jim couldn't help but laugh. That's nonsense, and you know it, he retorted. Of course I know it, and you know it, but Bob doesn't. I think I scared him enough to make him think twice before messing with you. Well, I appreciate that, buddy. They both grinned and took another sip of their drinks. You know what really annoys me? Jim began, that she doesn't believe me about not kissing some waitress. Are you absolutely sure you didn't? Maybe just a peck on the cheek or something like that? No, I... He trailed off, and Tony could tell from his expression that he recalled something. Ah, uh -huh. you did kiss her, didn't you? No, she kissed me, Jim responded. Damn, I know what this is all about. The following day, Cindy was surprised to see Jim walking into her office at work. He immediately informed her that he was taking her to lunch before she could react. Assuming it was his way of apologizing, she expressed gratitude but mentioned it was a bit early and asked if he could wait about 20 minutes. Jim reassured her, saying there was no need to wait. He had already spoken to her boss, explained the situation as a minor family emergency, and arranged for an extended lunch hour, which her boss agreed to. Jim urged her to come along, and Cindy, feeling apprehensive as she wasn't aware of any family emergencies, followed him to the car. As she got in, Jim held the door for her. She questioned him about their destination and the nature of the family emergency. He didn't directly answer her question but instructed her to call her friend and get the name of the restaurant where the alleged incident occurred. When she asked why, he simply told her to trust him and mentioned that he believed he had figured something out. Reluctantly, 
She called her friend and obtained the restaurant's name, Demars on Homan Avenue. He responded with a smile, commenting on the coincidence that they were headed exactly there. Cindy remained silent but felt increasingly uneasy. She couldn't fathom why he would want to revisit the scene, except perhaps to confront her. Would he flirt with the waitress in front of her? She knew he wouldn't do that. She decided to wait and see what unfolded. The journey to the restaurant took nearly half an hour, during which Cindy agonized over numerous scenarios. She was almost in tears when they arrived. Jim placed his hand on her back and guided her inside. She knew trouble awaited her the moment they entered. Damn, she muttered quietly. Jim found a booth and had Cindy sit first, then joined her. Well, cuz, looks like you brought your better half today. Cindy blushed with embarrassment. Hi, Marilyn. She greeted their waitress. Hi, Cindy. How did you manage to get my cousin here for a real lunch? And with his wife, no less. Every time I see him, he's in such a hurry he can barely eat, she joked. Jim wasn't about to let Cindy off easily. Cindy seems to think you and I are having a passionate affair, he announced. Cindy waited for the punchline before responding. What? No, Marilyn, that's not true. Cindy turned to her husband. Jim, come on, I made a mistake. I apologize. She faced Marilyn again. A friend told me last week that he kissed a waitress here. I didn't even know you worked here, but we haven't. Last week, Jim interrupted. You gave me a peck on the cheek when I arrived. Oh gosh, Cindy, I didn't mean anything by it. Jim hadn't visited in a while, and it was just a friendly gesture. Marilyn, don't worry about it. Cindy assured her, I understand now. My friend missled me into thinking, Jim had a thing with a waitress here. I'll be giving her a piece of my mind later. I'd like to hear that, Jim challenged. Cindy looked at him and accepted the challenge. All right, she said, retrieving her phone from her purse. Both Jim and Marilyn listened in on Cindy's side of the conversation. Hi, Linda. Not too good. You know that waitress who you said was kissing Jim. You know who that was? Jim's cousin. Yeah, his cousin. No, I didn't like what you said to me. You made it sound like he was having an affair. No. I didn't like what you said to me. You made it sound like he was having an affair or something. I don't care what you think. I don't care if you think you see him fucking someone in the middle of the room. From now on, keep your gossip to yourself. Yes, you too. She almost hurt her finger while passing out. Jim had a feeling that it was Linda who was getting into trouble. She often made derogatory remarks about her own husband, created problems. She often made derogatory remarks about her own husband. Cindy was stressed out after the call. I sincerely apologize. In front of both of you, Jim was right. I should have known better. You need to make some more apologies when you get home tonight, Jim reminded her. You're going to apologize to Tony, Barbara, and Jenny. What about Bob? You can tell Bob to take a walk. You're not stalking a married woman no matter how flirtatious she is. Marilyn was still standing there. Who is Bob? She asked. Her boyfriend, Jim joked. The guy, she asked. Don't listen to him, Marilyn. I made a mistake and he hasn't finished poking me in the face yet. Looks like you two had a good weekend, Marilyn said. Let's just say that I'm pretty sure Cindy has learned her lesson about trust, Jim replied. Cindy was more than a little confused. Her face turned red as she opened the menu. So Marilyn, what do you recommend? Later, after dinner, Cindy talked on the phone for almost an hour, apologizing to their friends, including Jenny. That night, they both lay naked in bed. Are you still angry? It depends. On what? To my friends, including Jenny. That night, they both lay naked in bed. Are you still angry? It depends. On what? About whether you still think that I will cheat on you. I never really believed that you would cheat on me. I was worried that you might give some woman the wrong impression. I just didn't want you to cheat on her. He considered her words and remembered how angry he had been watching her flirt with Bob. He would never admit it, 
but now he understood her point of view a little better. Just as he was about to tell her that he had forgiven her, he felt her hand slide down his body and start tickling his balls. Come on, honey. You can't be mad at me, she cooed. He decided that he might not tell her yet that he had forgiven her. Her fingers gently wrapped around his manhood and slowly began stroking it up and down. After a few seconds, he felt himself getting hard. Jim closed his eyes and sighed softly as her long red hair brushed his skin. The loving touch of her lips sent chills down his spine as she kissed the head of his fully aroused friend. Oh God, he groaned. She already knew she was forgiven, but Cindy wanted to push it to the limit. She swung one leg over his torso and guided him inside her. She closed her eyes and leaned forward, putting her hands on his tense abs, moving back and forth, driving him deeper and deeper. Oh baby, I am. I won't last long, he groaned. Me too, she replied. A moment later, she threw her head back as her body tensed. It was Jim's signal, and he was just in time, as they both gave themselves up to intense pleasure. A month later, Cindy and Barbara had lunch together. You and Jim seem to get along. Is he still flirting with the waitresses? Not so often, Cindy replied. He's still friendly, and I wouldn't want it to be any different. I like that about him, but he seems to back off from time to time. That's all you really wanted, isn't it? Exactly. Barbara had to ask her next question, even though she thought she knew the answer. So, have you heard anything about Bob lately? No, and to tell you the truth, I'm a little offended. One punch and he just disappears, weakling. They both laughed at that.